Go ahead and get started because I want to be mindful of your, um, your schedules. I would like to thank everyone for coming out to this Black History Month event. We're all in for a treat this afternoon. And before I start, everyone has an evaluation on your table. If you would be so kind to complete that before you leave, and you can just leave it on the table um, before you leave. Also, want to remind you that we still have two more events happening uh, for Black History Month. Uh, tomorrow, Friday, we have downtown at the Loosemore Auditorium. We have real soulful music. So if you're not doing anything tomorrow at 7 p.m., please stop um, by um, Loosemore Auditorium. And then finally, next Tuesday, we're very fortunate to have Diane Nash, um, one of the Freedom Riders. And uh, she's going to talk about um, her struggle and the struggle during that time. So please come out next uh, Tuesday at 12 noon, and that's going to take place now in the Grand River Room. Just a little bit about um, H. James Williams, the Dean of Seaman College of Business. I mean, I remember the first time I seen his, uh, his bio and just all the letters, you know, that he has behind his name was just was just just mind blowing. And if you are not aware of it, I, I mean, I just have to share just a couple with you. Um, earn a BS degree in accounting from North Carolina Central University. Matter of fact, I don't know if you know that they played um, Indiana University in basketball last night, and they and they lost. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a MBA degree in accounting at the University of Wisconsin Madison, a PhD in accounting at the University of Georgia Athens, a JD and an LLM taxation degrees at Georgetown University Law Center. He's also a certified public accountant and a certified management accountant with a wealth of practical experience having worked in the public accounting profession and in the legal profession, profession as a corporate and tax attorney. When I first met Dean Williams, because he uh, comes from North Carolina, I was fortunate enough to um, attend University of North Carolina Wilmington for my undergraduate degree. And one of my classmates uh, from many, many years ago, him and Dean Williams are very, very close friends, and he shared that with me um, early in our relationship. And I share that with you, in particular the students, because you just never know who you might come in contact with as you build these relationships on this campus and other campus. Just be mindful of um, how those relationships uh, venture out into the world. Please help me welcome Dean Williams at this time. Thank you, Bobby. And thank all of you for coming out this afternoon to share some time with me. I, I really appreciate this. I was thinking that I haven't had the opportunity to talk to folks about black history or during Black History Month for almost 12 years now. So it's been a long drought. And so I appreciate the opportunity to make some comments. And I'll tell you at the outset that my notion is not to try to proselytize anyone. I understand that we all have our different perspectives. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to share you, with you some of mine. I understand fundamentally that we seem to view the world as human beings from our own particular points of view. That is from where we stand. And that's why I decided to title this talk, From Where I Stand. Because 
The sum total of all of my experiences is why I'm here today and how I'm here today, quite frankly. And those experiences obviously color who I am and the way I view the world. I think it was President Lincoln once said, there are no accidents, for every effect must have its cause. The past is the cause of the present, and the present will be the cause of the future. So again, by that logic, I am here based on the sum total of the experiences that I've had over the years, and I'd like to share some of those with you. I hope I will spend some time afterwards answering questions that you might have as well. So please bear with me for a minute. I'd like to start by giving you a sense of sort of where I stand, because the bottom line is that as I stand here thinking about what I might say to you, I have sort of three theses that seem to make sense to me. Number one, I believe that during this Black History Month, we ought to be thinking about the civil rights movement at a minimum. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about that piece. And when we talk about the civil rights movement, there's some particular pieces that I think we ought to pay attention to. Number two, I'm concerned about victimization by institutional and individual racism. And so I'd like to explore that just a little bit as well, to talk about what institutional racism is, to talk about individual racism, to talk about how we sometimes become victimized and what we need to do to assure that we are not victims of that kind of nonsense. And then finally, I'd like to make just a few comments around the kind of progress that the United States has made in race relations and equity over my lifetime, the kinds of things that have changed since I was born. And to talk, of course, about how it is that we have a long ways to go yet. So those three things I'd like to talk about, but again, I'd like to provide some context for you, some framework, if you will. I'd have to tell you that I grew up in an all black community, in a working class family. My mother and father are both ministers. In fact, I have two sisters who are ministers as well. And so in our family of eight, there were four ministers. So that will tell you a little bit about sort of the things that went on in our house and, and the ways that we were expected, you know, to conduct ourselves. And that has made a big difference, not only in the way I conduct myself, but in the way I view the world. And I think it makes a difference. And I can tell that often when I'm uh, chatting with my colleagues uh, or with my classmates in, in the, in the uh, days when I was going through school. But it does make a difference because the thing that happened in my community and in my home is that my parents and my community were very careful to protect my siblings and me from all the ugliness of racism. I grew up in the Jim Crow South, but I did not understand or did not appreciate or did not experience Jim Crow hardly at all. I can't remember an instance when I encountered Jim Crowism as I grew up in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. My parents had moved from South Carolina to North Carolina in that whole migration era where African Americans were moving from the <coughs> South for better opportunities in the North, but they stopped in North Carolina. They left the, the, the whole notion of, of, of farming and and you know, being sharecroppers to move into textiles and opportunities to manufacture cigarettes. But they moved that far north and stopped. They did not share with me while I was young. And in fact, they haven't shared with me hardly at any, hardly any rather, even after I became an adult, the experiences that they had. I've had to drag those from them, and I'm not sure exactly why that is, but I've had to drag that out of them. So they didn't share with us as we were young children, all the challenges that they faced, that I know they faced in the Jim Crow South. So I grew up in a sheltered, sort of protected environment and life was wonderful. Life was wonderful. I grew up in an all black community. I, I didn't worry about someone calling me the N-word. Never had that kind of experience. I knew in school that if someone said I wasn't doing well, it wasn't because of the color of my skin, it was because I wasn't doing well and I needed to do something. Uh, we were in a close enough knit community that my parents knew the teachers 
And I know that when the teacher said to me, do you want me to punish you or would you rather I tell your parents? <laughs> that was a no-brainer. Please punish me. But the, but the point is that I grew up in that environment and that was fantastic on the one hand. But on the other hand, that protectionism cuts in both directions. And so what I learned upon forced integration or desegregation is that there was a lot that I was missing, a lot that I didn't know. There was a lot in my personal professional development that escaped me because I was not exposed to other races and other ethnicities. And I started to learn that when I was forced out of my neighborhood to a, a, a neighborhood on the outskirts of Winston-Salem, because that's the way they decided they needed to desegregate, is to move all the African Americans from their communities to the communities in the, in the outlying regions. But the point is that when I did get there, I started to understand and appreciate some of what I was missing. I also started to appreciate some of the ugliness of racism. I was 15 years old when I moved into the 10th grade to an all-white environment, or mostly white environment. And on the first day of football practice, before school started, my sister dropped me off at the, at the school so that I could start the practice. And she planned to come pick me up at a certain time because that's when we thought practice would be over. But as it turns out, practice didn't extend as long as we thought. And so with a lot of time left before she would come to get me, everybody had left the school. And from my vantage point at least, we're in the middle of nowhere there. And so I concluded that I needed to start walking at least in the direction that I thought she would travel. And as I walked in that direction that I thought she would travel, I was confronted by racism for the first time, really, as a group of white kids decided that I shouldn't be in their neighborhood. And so what I remember is running as fast as I could. Afraid, afraid literally for my life based on what they were screaming at me. That was the first experience. On the other hand, I had great, great relationships that I developed there during high school. I had a great learning experience. Uh, and in fact, the person who helped me most uh, probably to, to become associated with the program that has meant as much to my life as anything was a white history teacher who suggested that I ought to at least consider the Upward Bound, Upward Bound program. And she worked with me to make sure that I got into that program. Had it not been for her, I would not have had that experience, and I believe my whole life would be different right now. So on the one hand, there was the ugliness. On the other hand, I'm really appreciative for the fact that I had a caring teacher who happened to be non-African American who really thought that I maybe had something, something uh, worth salvaging and that, in fact, I could probably make a difference in the world. And so she reached out to me, and, and I'll never forget that one. Now, at our high school, we could have an all-black, I'm sorry, we could have a majority black basketball team, but we couldn't have a majority black players on the floor at the same time. And how dare the coach put five black players on the, on the court at the same time. And the principal walked out on the basketball court and stopped that for us. So we understood sort of what that meant. We understood where we, where we were at that point in time. And quite frankly, when, in my senior year, when I finished playing football and it was time to recognize those who had achieved, I felt that I had been mistreated because I was not recognized and I was good. <laughs> but there had to be five white players as well as five black players, although there must have been 85% black football team. Those are the kinds of experiences that I had. And again, that's not to say, on the other hand, that I didn't have a good, good experience overall. Those are just the kinds of things that happened. And I didn't blame, for, I didn't play, blame East Forsyth for that. I blamed individuals for the work that they did or didn't do and the ways that they treated me. And that's what I've tried to do throughout my life, is to look at folks and, and to deal with situations individually, one at a time. 
When I finished undergrad, I went to North Carolina Central University, and that's primarily African American. At the time I was there, it's probably 99%. It might be 95% now. And in my way of looking at the world, schools like NCCU do a lousy job of, provi of, of providing opportunities for those students to understand how they fit with the rest of the world. In other words, we talk about diversity. I don't think those schools do a great job at all. It's the exception rather than the rule in my way of looking at the world at least. So I was there and I had a great experience there as well. And again, mostly African-American teachers and African-American classmates, uh, but I was able to excel and I got great guidance and direction and was able to move on very fruitfully, I think, uh, and worked with Ernst & Young coming out of undergrad. And that was a great plum job. In fact, I must have had six job offers as I finished undergrad. And these were job offers at businesses, as you can imagine, that were predominantly white. And I worked with Ernst & Young in Winston-Salem, North Carolina at a time when I was not allowed to work on some of the bigger clients, only because I am African-American. And I knew that. And the partners didn't try to spare me that. On the other hand, Although I was only one of two African Americans in that office of 85 professionals, I'd say that I learned a heck of a lot. And I was treated with the kind of respect and with the degree of professionalism that I expected. And that I have come to expect ever since. And, and I believe that that experience prepared me so well that I was able to achieve the other things that I was able to achieve later in life. And it was just the little things. And you know, I have one of the challenges I have right now, quite frankly, is as I move around this community even, at the higher levels, everybody says the right things. CEOs and all the C-level folks all talk about diversity and inclusion. And I believe them. On the other hand, I do understand that it doesn't always filter down to the working, to the working level. And that's one of the challenges I have. And it's one of the challenges that I present to the leaders here in this business community, that we need to figure out a way to make sure that what we're espousing at the upper echelons, in fact, wind up being inculcated in the culture so that, in fact, folks really feel the inclusion that we profess. That doesn't always happen here and doesn't always happen in business around the world. But one of the things that I appreciated at Ernst & Young, quite frankly, is that, again, I did feel that kind of professionalism and folks seemed to respect my opinions uh, and to make sure that I had good assignments outside of the ones that I, couldn't, that I couldn't work on. When I decided to go back to earn an MBA, in fact, Ernst & Young was right there to support me. They allowed me to take a leave of absence. And while I was in school, when I had a break, they allowed me to work so that I could earn money to support myself while I was finishing the MBA program. So they did everything that they could do, I think. When I concluded that I wanted to come into the academy, I moved directly into a PhD program. And Ernst & Young was very supportive of that. And in my second year, as I was trying to figure, in the, at the, in the middle of my second year, as I was trying to figure out how I would get my dissertation done, I got a phone call from the partner in charge of that office. And he says, James, he says, you know, we have fellowships to support st students who are studying accounting. How would you like me to nominate you? Out of the clear blue sky. And I could tell you another story on the other side of that uh, that would maybe put that in a better perspective. But in the final analysis, the bottom line point was he did nominate me and he did support my, my application. And I did, in fact, receive the fellowship that allowed me to finish that PhD program in record time. In two and a half years, I was complete. I had completed my PhD in accounting, and that was unheard of at the University of Georgia in Athens. The University of Georgia where, when I went there, the first word I got was from the director of the, of the program who pulled me aside and said, you know, you, you earned great grades at Wisconsin-Madison, and so I'm going to suggest that you take this econometrics track. He says, now I'm not, not going to tell the rest of your classmates this, because I'm not sure that they can get that done but I want you to do this. But I don't want you to get a big head about it. And then he spent the next five minutes admonishing me about getting a, having a big head. 
I do have a big head, but but <laughs> but not in that sense. Uh, so 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 I said fine, and and I had no problems with that. And again, my classmates were were fantastic there in Athens, Georgia, and I had a good experience, generally speaking. But I do recall that that same director, when it was time for the the university to submit one person to receive a fellowship. He decided, he told me, well, we're not going to nominate you because Sue over here has a higher GMAT score. And he didn't know that I knew that Sue didn't have a higher GMAT score than I did. But what am I going to do, right? At any rate, the one thing that that really, in my way of thinking, was something that I considered to be racist. And again, I, I don't usually look for racism. And in fact, as I teach my kids, that's the last thing I will consider. I always start at home, and what am I not doing in the whole nine yards? But I was in a finance class. My related field was finance in, in the PhD program. And I was in a finance class with the chairperson of the finance department. And there were eight of us in that class. So going into the final exam, I knew that I had done pretty well, but I hadn't eight, made 98s, I had made 91s, okay? And so I knew I had to do well you know, on the final as well. And I knew I had done well. When I came back, they had all the grades listed on the door. And there were seven A's and one B. So when I go to the, to the uh, professor, because I had the B, I go to the professor to, help, to have him help me understand what happened. I wanted to see my exam, because I knew I had done well. And sure enough, I had done well. I had earned a 96 on the final. But he concluded, what he shared with me is, well, at the, after, the, after, at the end of this thing, as I graded the papers, I decided that although we said these things were going to count, the final exam was going to count 25% and all the other exams 25%, I concluded that that probably was not the best thing. So I changed the, I changed the weights. And I changed the weights in such a way that you wound up, you know, at a 92 and you needed a 93 for an A. Now, now I was really angry then. And I don't care whether it was racism or not. <laughs> I was really angry. I thought that was totally unfair. But again, what am I going to do? Right? At least my reaction was, I'm not going to jeopardize my PhD to put some nut in his place. So I simply went home to my apartment and put my fist through the wall. And then I called my mother. <laughs> Help, mom. <laughs> no. <laughs> but at any rate, I mean, those are some of the kinds of experiences that I had. But on the other hand, on the other hand, I had my car stolen. And when I had my car stolen, everybody in that school of business seemed to step up to try to help me find a way. The chairperson of the, of the director of the School of Accounting offered to lend me his car. The dissertation chairperson wanted to pay once they found the car. It was all torn up and it had to be fixed, and I couldn't afford to fix it, obviously. Um, he wanted to pay to fix it. I mean, everybody kind of stepped up and tried to figure out how they could help me to address this issue. You know, that, 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 you know, caused me a little bit of a challenge. At any rate, that's the University of Georgia, and those are some of my experiences. But I, but I say that because, you know, I'm one who believes that we ought not, as African Americans in particular, and I won't try to speak for anybody else, but for myself and my kids, my family, we're not going to look for racism. We're not going to look for discrimination. We're going to understand that it exists, but we're going to hold ourselves to a high standard, and we're going to do the absolute best that we can do, and we're going to not deal with foolishness to the, unless to the extent that we must. And that's what I try to teach my kids. But it's tough, as you can imagine, because on the one hand, tell my kids, everybody is equal. Doesn't matter what the color of the skin is. And yet, you know, I have a, a daughter who's 21 now and a, daughter, and a son who's 17. And as they go through high school, they're dating interracially. Because 
everybody's the same, of course. But then I also have to tell them, and oh, by the way, not everybody thinks this is a good idea. Not everybody believes as you believe. And so we need to protect, we need to protect ourselves and, and, and as we go through this process and recognize that while you understand this, not everybody else does. I mean, those are some of the kinds of challenges that we've had to, had to address. And yet, I still think in the final analysis, that makes, makes more sense, again, based on what I've learned throughout my life and the way I was raised and my belief system, including um, my religious beliefs. And so that's what we try to do. I wanted to make at least a couple of comments about this Black History Month generally. Someone says, should we even have a Black History Month? And my reaction is, until American history fully embraces and reflects all Americans in history, we ought to do this. And in fact, I don't know why it's not a bad idea to do something like this anyway. I mean, why not celebrate? And I don't mean just African Americans, I mean all ethnicities. Why not? I think it's a fantastic idea. Uh, for one thing, it gives us an opportunity to focus for a minute on somebody else, on some other culture. It helps us to have a better appreciation for what these other cultures might have to offer. And so I'm all for that. Having said that, one of the things I think ought to happen during African American, uh, uh, um, Black History Month for, in particular is that while we celebrate all the great things, and I am so glad that for the young kids, we're always focused on the positives. And so we teach them about Garrett Morgan, and we teach them about um, you know, uh, Du Bois, and we, and we teach them about all the, the Martin Luther King Juniors and all the other folks who've done so well, and we need that. We need to, the young folks need that, but we need that as well. But one of the things that I feel strongly about is that we ought to be celebrating those other faceless, nameless others. The ones whose names we don't know. The ones who suffered, bled, and died so that we could all be in this room together sharing. I believe we ought to spend some time thinking about those folks. In fact, one of the things I particularly appreciate about, appreciate about Martin Luther King Jr. is that he understood that. And if you'll indulge me, I'll read this from his speech when he earned the, when he earned the Nobel Peace Prize. In his speech, he, and I'll quote, every time I take a flight, I am always mindful of the many people who make a successful journey possible the known pilots, and the unknown ground crew. So you honor the dedicated pilots of our struggle who have sat at the controls as the freedom movement soared into orbit. You honor the ground crew without whose labor and sacrifices the jet flights to freedom could never have left the earth. Most of these people will never make the headline and their names will not appear in who's who. Yet when years have rolled past, and when the blazing light of truth is focused on this marvelous age in which we live, men and women will know and children will be taught that we have a finer land, a better people, a more noble civilization because these humble children of God were willing to suffer for righteousness sake. And when you, and when I, and when you think about those, those nameless others, they aren't all African American. And I think we understand that. I hope we understand that. They aren't all African American. We would not have been able to achieve what we've been able to achieve as a race without the support of others outside of the race, if you will. I mean, you think about folks who have also died in the battle. You think about the, the, the Goodmans and the Schwerners, along with Cheney, down in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Those folks gave their lives so that we could be here today. And it probably goes on and on and on. You think about the folks who were on the Freedom Rides. They weren't all African Americans. We can only achieve if we combine our goodwill and we work together to make sure that we stamp out the racism wherever we find it. And sometimes it takes monumental efforts to do that. I have one other thing I'd like to, to, to read on another topic, if I may. A couple of, month, couple of weeks ago, rather, I was in a function when where we had um, a celebrity, a real celebrity, talking about World War II history. And he read a section from 
the uh, 1925 work, Army War College report that goes something like, well, it goes like this, because I'm quoting. The Negro is by nature subservient and believes himself to be inferior to the white man. He is most susceptible to the influence of crowd psychology. He cannot control himself in the face of danger to the extent the white man can. He has not the initiative and resourcefulness of the white man. <clears throat> he is mentally inferior to the white man. Now, now the person read this as a quote because he was talking about what happened in World War II and in part why the four armed forces were still segregated. Now, any of you who saw the movie Red Tails probably saw this same quote, or, or at least a part of this quote in that movie. But the point is that when we talk about institutional racism, that is institutional racism. That was, a, if it weren't the, the official policy of the military, of the army, it certainly was an official document. And that's the kind of stuff that's scary when you start talking about institutional racism of that sort. Back in 1934, the federal government even started this thing. I mean, you guys know what redlining is, right? It was the federal government that started redlining. The Federal Home Loan Bank Board asked another group to screen 239 cities and identify a security map, if you will. And they wanted them to highlight where they should not invest dollars in homes. That's the, what was the federal government doing that? And that's how the whole redlining thing started. And now we know it's a blight, and we have new legislation, obviously, that's designed to address that, the Community Reinvestment Act in particular. But we have other mechanisms to try to address that, but that's institutional racism. When the institutions, especially the governmental institutions, have those kinds of policies that are based on race rather than the other critical factors that ought to be considered, then we have a problem. Some companies do the same thing. And we know that companies have some of these same policies. And some of them are overt, some of them are more covert. I have a problem with it because on the one hand, when we call them institutional racism, we understand what that means. But my problem is, because we call it institutional race, racism, we make it bigger than it needs to be. Because in the final analysis, like someone said one time before, corporations talk about their value systems, but corporations don't have value systems. The persons who work in the corporations have value systems. Corporations are inanimate objects. They can't do a thing except through the human beings. And when we talk about institutional racism, I think we make it bigger than it needs to be. We need to be focusing on the individuals who are creating the laws that institutionalize their racism. And we need to fight that as, as, as diligently and as vigilantly as we can. And it takes all of us to fight that. But we clearly need to try to fight that. The other part that bothers me about this whole institutional racism piece is that we allow it to victimize us. We become victimized by it. And when I say we become victimized, I say we use it as crutches. And it's too easy. I mean, it's, always been my, it's always been my position. It's too easy for me to blame something on racism, especially institutional racism. It's too easy when someone says, James, you haven't reached the level that you should have reached to say that's racist. Or it's too easy when somebody criticizes the way I operate to say, yes, yeah, coming from that white person, that's racist. That's too easy. That's a crutch. And it won't challenge me to do better. I'll never forget when I was in, at the University of Georgia, I had a good friend who was an MBA student. And she was having difficulty finding a job, African-American young lady. And we weren't great friends, but we were classmates. So she was talking to me, and she was she was, you know, bemoaning the fact that she couldn't find a job and how racist everybody was because she couldn't find a job. And I'm listening to her speak to me, and she wants to be a marketing person, and she couldn't have, she didn't have command of the English language. And I'm thinking, I wouldn't hire you either. 
I, I mean, I, I was clearly thinking, I wouldn't hire you either, not to be in my marketing department. Again, it's too easy, and I've seen that time and time again, where it's racist, and that's why I'm not moving forward. It's racism, and that's why I don't get the opportunity. It's racism, and that's why I got this failing grade. You can't allow that to be the crutch. You can't allow that to be, to make us victims. And that's, my, that's one of my real concerns about young folks. And that's one of the reasons I've taught my kids the way I've taught them. So that they won't become victims. They know it exists, we need to figure out how to address it, but we're not gonna become victimized by racism of any sort, individual or institutional. Progress. I think we've made some progress in the U.S. You know, I, I said about a month ago, I was talking to a group and I talked about my uh, father-in-law who's now passed away and, and you know, how great a family man he was. He was a, um, a recognized veteran from World War II. Uh, and back early in his life, he took a trip to Washington, D.C., 650 miles, to hear Martin Luther King Jr. talk about the dream. And then some 45 years later, my wife, my kids, and I drove over to Washington, D.C. and stood in almost the same spot and watched Barack Obama become president of the United States. And we thought to ourselves, wow. Wow. Certainly we've made some progress. But as I said to the group about a month ago, and you know, I, I, I don't know if you guys know the Robert, Robert Frost poem, Walking Through Woods on a Snowy Evening. I like that one. Um, but at the end of that poem, he says, the woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. And that's the way I, I look at what the U.S. still has to do. We've made a lot of progress, but we have miles to go before we're able to sleep. Absolutely. There's a lot more work that we have to get done. So have we made progress? Yes. Back in 1862 in September, President Lincoln sent a letter to Congress, sort of forewarning about the Emancipation Proclamation. January of 1863 is January 1 of 1863 is going to become effective. He followed up on December 1, 1862, with one of his famous speeches. He said, "The dogmas of the past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise to that occasion." And as our case is new, we must think anew, and we must act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. President Lincoln knew then that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And he understood that slavery was a real scourge upon the earth. He understood what it was doing to the soul of the United States. He understood we needed to do something. On the other hand, like, to, like in too many other instances, we treat the symptom and not the disease. And slavery is just a symptom. Just as Jim Crow was just a symptom. And just as the new Jim Crow is just a symptom. The real disease is prejudice, it's racial prejudice. And that's what we have to try to stamp out in the final analysis. Because if we don't, just as Michelle Alexander says in her new book, The New Jim Crow, there will be another way. There will always be another opportunity, another uh, tact, if you will, to achieve the same kind of disenfranchisement and you know, dampening of a, a racist spirit, if you will, as long as there's the racial, racial prejudice that exists. So we have to try to address the real issue and not continue to deal with the symptoms. And so finally, I guess I would say, here at Grand Valley, we take great pride in saying that we take students one at a time. Take students where we find them. 
the notion being that we're going to facilitate their educating themselves well, and we're going to do what we must do so that you have that shot. And great movements are led by great persons, there's no doubt about it. But it's also made up of great persons, as I alluded to earlier. Those faceless, nameless persons who showed up nonetheless, who put themselves in harm's way nonetheless, who stood up and were counted nonetheless. And that's what I would charge all of us to do. That we need to think about how we can make a difference, however small that difference might seem to us. Martin Luther King Jr. who said, don't ever, don't ever fail to step in when it involves a human being or an animal. Because whatever the penalty that society might impose, it's not nearly as significant as what we do to our souls when we look away. And so I would challenge all of you to indeed shape your lives, your professions, and your societies. Because as our case is new, we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves. In other words, we must un unshackle ourselves, and then we can save our country. Thank you. <laughs> now, I'll take any questions you might have or any comments or observations you'd like to make. Anybody? Yes, sir. There are good reasons historically why we have these uh, HBCUs. HBCUs in the United States. Uh, are you saying that they outlive their usefulness? And, and I guess I would make a parallel. We used to have many more women's colleges. Right. And there's this need for sheltering certain groups. Are you saying that you feel this? No, I'm not saying that. Um, I'm, what I'm saying is that I think the schools need to do a better job of providing some diversity. I still think that the H historically black colleges and universities go by the acronym of HBCUs. I believe that those historically black colleges and universities are, in fact, still needed because they have a different mission than most other universities in the, in the country. And they, are, they know that they're focused. They wind up having some of the more difficult challenges because they're dealing with, in many instances, populations uh, that have not had the best kind of educational backgrounds because they've come from you know, blighted cities. They've come from school systems where those funds aren't there to, to make sure that they're getting the qu good quality education. And I think those historically black colleges and universities do a great job with the resources they have. So I'm not suggesting that, in fact, their time is run. Any other questions? OK. No comments? Oh, I thank you. You guys have been, oh, yeah, Bob. I guess I have one in you know, regard. You mentioned uh, uh, Obama. Um, in your lifetime, did you ever think um, that a person of color would hold a high Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I don't know that I ever really thought about that. On the other hand, the, the way I was raised, I believed that we could do anything and we could achieve any level of success. And so while I didn't think about uh, an African American being president per se, you know, I always thought that, that we could achieve anything we wanted to achieve. And I certainly always thought that I could achieve anything I wanted to achieve. So. I, I, again, I just I had never thought about that, but but I think it is a tribute, though, to what we have been able to do as a country, because we have come a long ways, in my way of thinking, despite the fact that we have a long way to go. Any other? Well, again, I thank you. You've been kind.